My name is Samuel once again, and I'm the founder at Stakeosaurus, helping people get started with their first Ethereum Home Validator. And also, on the way, building a grassroots community of solo node operators here in Singapore and maybe Malaysia. So a little bit more about myself uh, and my background and how, how I got started on this journey. Um, I was always interested in the tech underlying blockchains and the Ethereum protocol, but I do not have a, a technical background myself. Instead, I spent the last five years of my career at a, doing Southeast Asian tech investments at a venture capital fund called TMB Aura. So uh, they're based here and they invest in Southeast Asia. Very great guys, very smart guys. Um, one of the most highest conviction and smartest uh, investors you'll find in the region. So if anyone's planning to raise, do consider them. Um, so uh, throughout my VC stint, I continue to stay in touch with the developments of the Ethereum protocol. And when 2020 came along, the Beacon Chain was launched. Uh, this was when I first attempted to spin up my own Ethereum validator. Um, obviously, I was quickly overwhelmed without a technical background. Um, <clears throat> and I found that the resources that were available online were catered more towards power users with technical backgrounds. And uh, I shelved the plan, continued studying, acquiring knowledge in my free time. Then in 2021, I managed to spin out a testnet node. Um, but I wasn't yet confident to put my own assets into my setup and trusting my own skill sets. I was paranoid, and, and rightly so, because I hadn't yet uh, understood the concepts behind what I was doing. So once again, I shelved the plan, explored the world of DeFi instead. Then in 2022, uh, when everything started blowing up, um, centralized exchanges, centralized staking platforms, there were smart contract exploits every week. <laughs> At this point, I was like, if I need to uh, put my assets to work and still be able to sleep soundly at night, uh, there's no other way other than to run my own validator. So I, I set out with determination to uh, learn all of the aspects enough to be confident uh, to put my assets into my validator. And in April 2022, I managed to get it to launch uh, together with a friend who uh, just wanted to learn the ropes as well. Um, and after that, uh, people started asking me to set up for them and run it for them as well. Uh, and soon, friends of friends started asking as well. So it became kind of like my passion project <laughs> for the whole of last year. Um, but somewhere along the way, I thought to myself, you know, it, it would be great if I had someone to show me the ropes to guide me along the way uh, throughout my own journey. So I imagine there will be other people out there. Yeah. So um, this is why I decided to give this a proper shot. And Stegosaurus was born in December 2022. Today, I run 14 validator nodes remotely uh, with around 10 more in the wait list. Um, shout out to team from EveSign, whose validator will be coming online next. Uh, thank you so much for your support. The uh, highest block reward my customers have received so far is around 0 0.8 ETH. There is one block proposal every 60 days per validator on average. And I have an attestation rate of more than 99%. So what I'm trying to say here is that all of this is possible, this levels of performance with home setups. And we should, as a community, um, start to shift our mindset away from, um, you know, participation in blockchain infrastructure should only be res uh, uh, reserved for uh, professional data centers with professional setups. So we should retake this uh, running of servers back into our own hands, right, uh, as we move towards the future. <clears throat> so at this point, you might be thinking, right, with so many convenient liquid staking options out there, why would anyone use uh, Stakeosaurus? And I would say it's because I provide an option uh, with the lowest possible trust assumptions by using the minimal amount of middleware required and only sticking to open source once they are verified by the community. I provide my services via, oh, sure, sure. Provide my services oh. via a guided setup um, and provide a knowledge transfer over time. Also, that my customers can choose to run their own node if they want to. Um, but more importantly, is so that they um, know what to look out for throughout their staking journey, um, because it's always what you don't know that will trip you up. Um, so it's definitely not for everyone, I acknowledge that. But my customers are those who care about security and want the closest equivalent to running their own node without still having to do so themselves. But why run your own node in the first place, right? So in short, running your own node benefits both yourself and the Ethereum network. But 
uh, these are the five reasons that I, I, I have in my mind, top of my mind. So number one is very obvious, 6.4% of pure, unadulterated imp rewards. As of today, there's been a lot of uh, influx of uh, new validators coming online, so this will continue to decline until a steady state. And, and these rewards, they are backed by real economic activity on top of the Ethereum network, uh, i.e. they're not Ponzi yields, and you do not have to be exposed to a separate asset class. Needless to say, it also improves the health of the Ethereum network by increasing decentralization. Um, you as a validator node operator get to benefit from the growth of the entire Ethereum ecosystem because increase in economic activity leads to more transactions. More transactions means more fees. More fees means it flows back to you as a validator. So think of it as a low beta way to get exposure to uh, all of the projects on top of the Ethereum ecosystem. There is also a chance to, re to receive windfall rewards. Higher so far is 192 if to a single validator. So it's like a continuous lottery ticket uh, that you hold uh, by running a validator and it draws every 12 seconds. But the point I wanted to make most, right, is that it's, to me, it's the most unruggable position that you can have for yourself because it is the most secure way to put your assets to work. And, and, and before I move on, uh, to understand this, we first have to acknowledge that there's always a trade-off between convenience and security. And let's look at all of the staking options uh, using this lens. And just a disclaimer, I'm not saying any of these options are good or bad. It's just that we need to find the options. You need to know what we're getting into, know what the trade-offs are, and find the options that are most suitable for ourselves. So starting from the convenience end, you have the centralized staking platforms or centralized exchanges. Trade-off here is obvious, you don't have custody of your assets, so anything under the sun can happen. Now if you move down the line, you have the smart contract based staking. Um, with this option, you are exposed to smart contract risks, you are exposed to multi six. So again, smart contract exploits can happen even if they are audited. Then you have the cloud-hosted staking and the pre-packaged nodes. So with these two options, even though you do not uh, have exposure to smart contract risk, but you are still dependent on yet another layer of middleware. Yeah? And, and if this middleware has some bugs or it goes down, it brings your node down along with anyone else who uses them. Yeah? And this is what we call correlated downtime. And this is when your penalties will, uh, will accrue very exponentially. Uh, similar to what happened, I think, last weekend or two weekends ago when there was a bug with Prism and Taku. Um, another point I wanted to make is for things like cloud hosted staking, right? If your node is physically consolidated with many other nodes, for example, if AWS goes down tomorrow for some reason, the, I can't imagine the slashing penalties it will, it will cause from that. Yeah? And then at the end of the line, you have self hosted Vanilla nodes, which is where Stickosaurus is at sacrificing all our convenience uh, in, in favor of security. So once again, definitely not for everyone. Uh, my customers will have to be involved throughout the setup process, sometimes throughout the maintenance process as well. And to further delve into the trade-offs, um, this is the way I think about risk with, when using any platforms related to Web3. So there are two broad categories of risk, smart contract risk and counterparty risk. Within smart contract risk, um, it's very obvious, there's risk of exploits, risk of explicit backdoors being inserted into the smart contract. This is when developers can run you outrightly. For counterparty risk, there's like multi six and governance attacks that can change the rules of the game and put you in a disfavorable position. Um, and yet, once again, the most overlooked one is the risk related to using middleware. Um, and the point I want to make here is that running your own node allows you to bypass most of these risks. It won't be all, because you still need to use some middleware, those open source ones, at least your, your execution client, your consensus client, right? Web3 signer. And on top of that, there are actually two sets of keys we have to note when choosing any of these staking options. The first is your Ethereum wallet for withdrawals. It's secured by your recovery seed. The second set of keys with a lot of staking options, you don't even get to see this because uh, the platform is the one holding these keys. So the validator itself actually has another set of keys. 
And the one that is usually exposed is called the signing key. Um, because at some point during the user journey, you might be required to upload this signing key onto the interface. And the consequence of exposing this signing key is that if someone gets a hold of that, they can spin up another validator with this signing key and cause it to be slashed. So a hypothetical attack they can launch against you is that, hey, give me 10 ETH, you know, I'll induce a slashing event and you'll lose 16 ETH. Are you a blackmail? And the other benefit of running your own node is that you get to be in charge of all the decentralization decisions. So the goal of all these decisions, right, is to ultimately help you to minimize what we want again call correlated downtime. Again, when your validator node goes down with a large portion of the network, the penalties are heavier. It is actually one of the known slashing conditions. But enough of the doom and gloom, let's uh, take a step back and look at what validators actually do. So to understand how it works under the hood, let's look at the value chain of Ethereum transactions. Um, starting from the top of the chain, you have the users who, by interacting with applications on top of the Ethereum network, will submit transactions. These transactions get held in a staging area called the mempool until it is built into a block, uh, either directly by the network or through block builders. Uh, if they go through the block builders, another group of participants called the MEV searchers would have to come in and peer into the mempool, look for arbitrage opportunities, and submit their own transactions that encapsulates these arbitrage opportunities to the block builders who then bundle it into a block and then send to the validator network. Now, this, this is where it's, it's important. A random validator will be chosen as a proposer every 12 seconds for every block, yeah? And they are the ones that execute these transactions in the block. Um, and then they get to keep all the transaction fees associated with that block. The other validators will serve as the testers who would vouch for the validity of said block. Once all of this is done, the new block is added to the blockchain and uh, after six and a half minutes, they're finalized. Of course, this is a highly abstracted uh, description, so give me some rope here. <clears throat> yeah, so as you can see, right, um, validators do actual work in exchange for the rewards they're getting. Yeah? It's not just because they're first uh, to the market and then they get to like, uh, 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 charge rent to everyone for doing nothing. They perform actual work. And in addition, the amount that the users pay collectively is more than what the validators receive, uh, which means all of the yield is real. The surplus is burnt, and this is what leads to the deflationary effect uh, on the Ethereum supply. So this is a question I get a lot from people, everyone. And to better understand this, let's look at some of the more common misconceptions and uh, the truth behind them. Most common of all is that you will be slashed if your validator goes offline. This is largely untrue because going offline, uncorrelated once again, incurs very small amount of penalties and you can easily recoup them by going online for the same amount of time. So if you're offline for one day, just turn it back on for the next day and you'll, you'll be back where you started. Um, how slashing occurs, right? There's two broad categories. First is what we call double signing. It's when you either um, sign two block, different block headers at the same block height, i.e. you endorse two different versions of the, of the blockchain, uh, two versions of the blockchain history at the same time, or you sign, um, you attest to one single block twice using the same public key, a private key. And this happens mostly because of improper redundancy setups because they try to over-engineer a setup and then somehow both private keys gets, goes online at the same time. The second is, as I mentioned, correlated downtime. Uh, you start to incur heavy penalties increasingly exponentially until um, you go back online. Second misconception is that you will get hacked easily if you don't have an expensive setup. Um, the truth is running a validator node on a Ethereum network today is a very democratized process can achieve a high level of security uh, by keeping it simple and by using open source hardware and software. And the last one is that you need to be a good programmer to run a validator node 
also not true. It's more like DevOps, if you guys know what, is, what that is, uh, than programming. You don't need complex code logic, um, but you do know to need to know what you're doing. Mistakes, mistakes can be costly, um, and you can think of it as using like serious software without the GUI. So then what does the actual skill set require, right? I would say these four components um, summarizes around 80% of what you need. The first is you need to understand how blockchain works on a basic technical level, how your validator works under the hood, what causes slashing and penalties, the most important part, and you need to keep up with the latest developments uh, related to staking. You also need to know how to secure devices and assets, website like hygiene, best practices, how to implement firewalls, brute force protection, access controls. You need to learn the Linux file systems and permissions, um, the, how to use command line interface, uh, be comfortable with reading logs to figure out what went wrong, if things go wrong. Uh, and potentially the most hairy of all is home networking. <laughs> because there's a lot of trial and error related to this uh, area of uh, knowledge. Um, what you want to do here is running your own node at home should not disrupt your daily usage of your home devices. And also, you want to have some level of segregation between your home device and your node device so that if your home device is compromised, uh, there's still an additional layer uh, that they have to bridge before they get to your node. Um, and, of course, you need to know how to configure remote access so that if you're on a holiday or you're out with your friends and something goes wrong with your node, you don't have to fly all the way back to your home to access your node. <clears throat> so for those of you, have, of you who are feeling adventurous, um, it's fairly easy to get started. There's a lot of online guides you can use to set up a testnet node. Yeah, but this is just the tip of the iceberg, I would say. Um, because what you want to achieve is, again, the confidence to be able to put your assets into your own setup and trusting your own skill sets. And, and to do that, I, I, won't look at, I won't go through all of the items here, um, but the most important step, I would say, is step seven, where after you accumulate all this fundamental knowledge, you have to practice, practice, redo your setup, and write your own guide. Because this is the part where your, both your knowledge and your confidence will increase exponentially. Um, after that, you can you know, choose to spin up a Gnosis uh, mainnet node because the Gnosis uh, node right, has the exact same uh, specifications set up everything as the Ethereum uh, node because Gnosis is a sidechain. And once you learn how to monitor your node, once you're comfortable with your process, then you can spin up a mainnet node. So step seven is, is, is like a bridge between your testnet setup and your mainnet setup. So for those of you, once again, who wants the extra push to get started, I will be conducting a small hands-on session um, to help you guys set up a testnet node on Google Cloud. So you don't need any uh, additional hardware, just your laptop will do. And um, it, will be, it will be conducted over Zoom over two days. And uh, I'll provide you with your, uh, a fit for purpose guide so you don't feel overwhelmed. So if any of you are interested, keen on this session, please feel free to let me know, reach out to me. Um, or if you know anyone, yourself or anyone who might be interested in my services to set up a home validator node, reach out to me on email or Telegram here. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for your time and attention. I hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you so much, Sam. Thank you, thank it was you. very, very enlightening. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you. Also, I was very convinced by the unruggable <laughs> bit. Yeah. So can I, does anybody have any questions for Sam before yeah, yeah, we move yeah. on? Anybody? Can I? Um, yeah. So what's your take on the layer? Does it help? Yeah, so the question was, what's my take on eigen layer and yeah. does it help? Um, so I, I'll answer the second question first. I think it helps with, uh, on the incentive part, to encourage more people to think about home staking because now the incentives can be increased on 6.4%, I don't know, potentially at 12, 15, 20%. Yeah? Um, my take is that it's interesting, but it has to be done uh, in a thoughtful manner for participants because what you're doing when restaking your ETH yeah, is you're endorsing another project or another layer's uh, consensus mechanism, right? And if not, not done properly, uh, you could be slashed. So again, there's a trade-off for higher yields and you need to know what to look out for, what to monitor. 
But overall, I think it's a great uh, direction. Well, I don't know if it's similar to Rocket Pool, which has another third party to buy contract risk also. Okay, the question is, will Eigenlayer be similar to Rocket Pool right, with an additional layer of smart contract risk? Um, I haven't looked into the actual Eigenlayer architecture, but I, I imagine it will be like that. Yeah, there's another smart contract that, that you have to um, sign up your validator to yeah, in order to be able to use your ETH to secure another network. Yeah. So either smart contract risk or middle layer. Hmm. Uh, what type of hardware requirement and is this still 32? Yeah, so the question is what type of hardware requirements do we need? What kind of uh, capital requirements do we need? So, uh, yes, you still need 32 if for a vanilla node, but there are many options out there that can lower the barriers to entry to capital. For example, Rocket Pool, you can get started with 70.6 previously. I think now with the new upgrade 10.4, you can get started. Uh, the soon to be launched um, status uh, EFX program, you can get started with as little as 4.4. But of course, again, there's a middle layer then when you use these uh, 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 protocols. Uh, Hardware-wise, right, it, it's, you only need a very low-powered CPU device. Um, there have been projects that are solving for producing uh, ARM devices, basically equivalent to Raspberry Pis, mm. uh, sub $400 uh, if taking notes. Um, but right now, what I'm using right, is the Intel NUC device, mostly, because uh, it's a very stable hardware, yeah, there's many generations behind it, so that I know whenever I encounter errors, right, it's my fault, it's the software side, it's not the hardware side. If you use like things like Orange Pi or like Rock 5D, right, potentially it's, it's a hardware fault and you don't know about it. Yeah. So all, all in, I think your, your hardware cost will be like 1,002, 2,005. Uh, do you also provide any advice on the uh, redundancy and improvement level? Let's say you go around and your family is to... Yeah. So, so, yeah. so the question is, do I provide redundancy advice on the human level on top of the, the machine level? Yeah. So what I do for my customers is, as part of my guided uh, process and my and knowledge transfer process, um, what I do is I teach them how to exit their validators in the event that I, I, I die in a car crash like, uh, the next day. <laughs> so, so you can basically you can exit your validator at any time, um, as long as you have your signing key. Sorry, one more. Okay. Uh, do you have any issue with your ISP running? Yes, there's a lot of issues with ISPs, and this this is the most time-consuming oh. part. Right there, because every ISP has its different quirks, <laughs> and there, there are a lot of us settings that do they do on the back end that is not visible to us on the front end. Yeah, unless we call them, and it's a, it's a pain to reach them. You gotta wait, and then they, they call you whenever they want. Yeah, so a lot of times we are, we are, we are forced to do like brute force try and error until we get it right. Yeah, yeah so, so this is a major hurdle to solve, actually. Have you tried VPNs? Uh, VPNs, is it? Uh, I find that I haven't found a, a good requirement for, for using VPNs yet. But what are you thinking of? Oh, your ISP How does that work? So, you have a connection with the control that is not under the management of ISP and you can go to another device that has more the connection to the ISP. Interesting. Let, let's uh, let's uh, catch up with this. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, how many hours of work do you think it takes to do solo staking? To, to get started from zero, zero to one? This is just for the cloud, they don't ask questions. Wow. Um, I mean, without my technical background, it took me like, of course, I didn't do it full time, right? Uh, it took me from 2020 to 2022. But if you do it every day, you learn, maybe like within like three months, you can be confident enough. Yeah. But of course, it's a continuous learning journey because there, there are new tools every day, and security is not a static uh, uh, setup. Yeah? You gotta, it always evolves, and then you have to evolve together with it. Okay. I'm thinking about it, but um, the tricky part about this business right, is that even though you, I'm just providing a service, um, by extension, I will be selling ETS. You know, if it goes on tomorrow, my reputation goes through the mud and so on. So I have to be very careful about it. But 
uh, <laughs> potentially layer two sequences if the incentive model becomes clearer. Yeah. Um, or you know uh, the major blockchain infrastructure platforms like Infura, they are opening up their no operator set to you know even potentially public and individuals. Okay, is that all for the questions? Okay, thank you so much. If you have anything, just give me a round of applause first. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Okay, so we'll move on next to Paul from Everlasting. He brought us our pizzas, so can we give him a very warm welcome? Thank you. Here you go. Yeah, thanks for coming along, everyone. And um, as I said, you know, we've kind of started uh, Everlasting. We are based in New Zealand. Uh, Luke's my co-founder over there as well. And we are also expanding into Singapore. So that was part of the reason for this trip. And also, yeah, nice way to, to meet a lot of you for the first time. And um, yeah, thank you to, to Karen and the organizers for inviting us along. I think it is. So my background yeah. uh, goes back uh, to 2012 in crypto, is, and um, in 2013 I started my first crypto consulting business, and it was still way too early. Obviously, it was only really uh, kind of Bitcoin and starting in Litecoin at that time. Um, but the first real pivotal point um, where kind of blockchain as an industry became real for me. Um, was when Ethereum was launching and I founded a company called Blockchain Labs and initially we set out to great, do some R&D and you know, build all the exciting things that um, smart contracts would enable. Uh, and the photo up there on the right is from one of the first conferences we ran in 2016 and actually one of the speakers was from the Ethereum Foundation and was a signer on uh, the DAO, you know, so the infamous DAO uh, smart contract. Um, oh, right, thank you. Uh, and that was the week that uh, the DAO got hacked. So um, really was a stark reminder that, hey, before we actually build anything on a blockchain, we need to make sure that it's secure. And so we did a lot of smart contract auditing over the the next five years, um, including for a number of um, protocols um, that are either global or um, launched here out of Singapore. And through that, I also ran a master's program along with one of the local uh, technical universities in New Zealand and uh, worked a lot with government and different policy uh, objectives that were being set at the time. And then this last photo is more recent. Um, this was more of a happy coincidence that a film crew from our, you know, kind of national media, One News, uh, wanted to do a prime time segment on what we were doing. And uh, they said, actually, can you show us the blockchain? And I went, well, we're running validator nodes. Here's the live, you know, kind of logs uh, streaming through. So it was a fun point uh, more recently. So I'll go through, um, obviously, I didn't want to repeat too much of what Sam's already gone through, of kind of a lot of what is staking and, and securing your setup. I want to add on top of that, perhaps more of a 102, uh, what are some things that you can level up once you've already got up and running with uh, validators. Cool, so some of my um, observations and beliefs around security, right, because, um, it's really hard to get people to make security front of mind, right? We've kind of got one hardware wallet or software wallet, one setup that um, you started with, and then you often just keep with it and you don't think about how uh, it can be improved. Uh, the other observation is that even as user experiences or new tooling comes in, there's still this inertia that people stick with what they know and what they're familiar with. And we've actually onboarded a lot of people into crypto with um, poor security practices. And uh, that's one of the things at Everlasting we're really trying to, to help to change. And how that relates to staking is um, also around uh, when there are active exploits. So this is one uh, just over a month ago, um, which uh, while it was generic in its um, application, you know, even still now, uh, it's not known, this is not a Minima specific 
uh, exploit. It's more that key material has been extracted from a large number of OGs, you know, and it's really hard when you're collecting um, some of the evidence around that of can you remember which wallet you might have imported your seed phrase in to in 2017 or 2018. It's, it's quite challenging. And actually, the saddest part was one of the uh, people that were affected, that already lost um, a significant amount of assets from their wallet from having lost a seed phrase, um, or the attacker having drained their wallet using their seed phrase. Uh, they also actually had uh, staking nodes running with that same key as their withdrawal address. Um, so it just added an extra insult into, into the injury of having lost their other assets as well as their staked ETH. Ooh. Um, another uh, recent uh, point there around uh, Ledger. Obviously, there's been a lot of discussion around how they've rolled out the firmware updates. And one of the things um, that we really need to take away from that is that we shouldn't have a single point of failure, right? So both of those two examples are ones where there was a single seed phrase controlling assets. And um, for this person, they did panic a little bit there. Uh, you know, it's not as bad as it seemed um, with Ledger, but once again, having a, um, you know, staking validator with a single, um, you know, withdrawal key that is your only, you know, it's tied to one seed phrase, right? There's nothing you can do if you lose it. Um, you can't go to the beacon chain and um, you can't then change your withdrawal key once it's set. Uh, so it's just really important to uh, look at other solutions. So one of the things we've been helping um, to help people level up with their security is around uh, using SAFE, which is one of the tools that's been around a uh, little bit over five years now. In fact, the first version of the, uh, the Safe Smart Contract was just called Multisig Wallet. And the Multisig Wallet um, you know, then became Gnosis Safe as we know it, and now just Safe. Um, and it manages just over uh, $68 billion worth of assets today on chain. And uh, yeah, really is battle tested, formally verified. So. There's a lot of trust across the ecosystem, and also you don't have to trust safe the company, right? Obviously the smart contracts are deployed onto Ethereum, and there's all of these other interfaces um, that you can go to should the safe primary website or the safe apps be down. So um, yeah, definitely recommend if you are gonna be setting up validators, um, even if you're using a um, staking service provider, set your withdrawal key to a safe multi-sig. Cool, so one of the questions we often get asked is like, hey, come on, multi-sigs, they're a bit old, they're clunky, you know, surely MPC is so much better, right? Um, you know, uh, Coinbase have launched their uh, Coinbase Cloud, uh, there's you know, obviously Fireblocks and a lot of other providers now that are uh, really pitching this message that, hey, MPC, come onto our platform, let us help you to secure your keys so you can sleep easily at night. Um, but it's not actually one or the other. Um, you can have both. Um, so I'd recommend actually combining the two, right? You can have a multi-sig where some of the keys are gonna be hardware wallets. Uh, some of the keys are going to be software wallets. Some can, if you opt in, be with a provider, right? So Ledger kind of uh, didn't roll it out very well, but I think we'll see a larger number of solutions uh, coming through that really create this hybrid custody and mean that any particular failure of a hardware wallet or a software wallet isn't going to result in the absolute loss of your, your assets. Cool. So then this next stage as we kind of go further into staking, um, there's a few other observations. Um, I was also, like Sam, you know, running uh, validator nodes on the beacon chain and you know, starting to, to see the evolution of tech. And one of the things that was promised from around 2022 was that we'd get distributed validators. I thought, okay, great, I'll check back in like 2024, right? This isn't gonna be something we're gonna see straight away. It's gonna take a long time to, to bring something like that to market. Um, but actually, it really 
is here today, and um, you know, there's two main uh, DBT uh, stacks. Uh, one's SSV and the other one's OVOL, and they're pretty battle-tested already. So, um, and it's not adding necessarily another middleware layer or another set of risk. It's more at the um, redundancy and making sure that the way that you build your redundancy into your staking uh, setup is as resilient as it can be to ISP failures or hardware failures and the like. Um, so my belief is that this highly resilient uh, kind of staking infrastructure um, is going to be really a commodity. It's going to be the dominant type of staking um, into the future. Uh, so obviously, uh, current levels of staking, we've seen centralized uh, validator services being the most dominant, always featuring the kind of top five in terms of uh, value of staked ETH. And I think within the next two years, um, we'll see that erode um, quite a lot. Cool. So another uh, tweet here. And this is a, another uh, friend of mine who has been similarly running home validator nodes for a bit over two years and um, had his first kind of catastrophic hard hardware failure. And, um, it uh, took him two weeks to really recover and work through and get it all back online. And it is something that um, we are seeing. It's not to um, scare anyone off. Like, he didn't lose massive amounts of, of ETH or rewards from that. It was only a two-week period. But it's something that we'd like to see less of, right? And uh, if only there was a tech that could give that, um, that resiliency, uh, and that is DBT. So. Now, one of the key things here, so when Sam was explaining to you of the role of the validator key to sign and to attest uh, on the beacon chain what's a valid block and to do all the other duties and aggregations uh, that are required for the sync committees, that's one key. And actually, we already know from uh, previous multi-sigs and threshold signatures um, or if you saw um, Jake's presentation from the last uh, ETH65 meetup, uh, BLS keys are really fantastic. They can be um, split, they can be joined. You know, there's a lot of uh, functionality built into uh, the BLS uh, signature schemes. So DVT takes your one validator key and can split it into four or more parts. And where that gets really interesting is then you have a threshold. So in this case, where it's been split into four parts, you only need three of those four parts to have to produce the valid signature that you're going to submit to the beacon chain. And it's not limited to that. You can then go up to three of five, five of seven, and as long as there's a you know threshold of signatures of your nodes that are able to attest or online then you're continuing to run and you're getting that uh, greater than 99% uptime regardless of hardware failures or ISP issues. So the other thing I really like about DVT is it's not just supporting client diversity, um, it's also helping with geographic diversity. And I think that's really important, uh, especially as regulations are still in flux, different geographies are trying to work out um, how to manage staking operations that might be uh, domiciled in their country today. Um, obviously, uh, when we look here, Europe and North America um, make up close to 80% of the uh, validators today, and that's a massive geographic uh, concentration. Uh, I'd like to see, I mean, Asia's already doing pretty well at kind of just over 12.5%. Um, but yeah, I'd like to see that spread out even further and into other continents like South America and, and Africa. And I really do believe that DVT um, and distributed validators are going to be one of the ways to, to help that happen, especially in some of the developing countries where their interconnections are so much more unreliable um, than we have. So how that works is that key um, that I said had been kind of split into different parts, you can actually run a, a node, you know, the same kind of validator stack that you would be running yourself in one instance. Uh, you could run here, you know, that's uh, seven different nodes. 
um, and they've all got a part of that validator key. So uh, you can spin them up in different data centers or different physical nodes if you uh, have a location to put them in. And um, also one of the concepts um, that's coming together is people who want to share that burden together, right? So this concept of squad staking without having to trust the other people running those nodes or with a reduced uh, trust uh, assumption, um, they have a shared incentive for keeping their node up and, and running as well. So um, that's another way that um, we can see more uh, people actively involved in the, their own staking and, um, and security there. Cool. So what it looks like from, this is the OBOL stack, so they have nice pretty pictures. Um, but what, what it looks like is you're still running the same execution client, and, um, still running the same uh, consensus layer client, and you've still got a requirement to sign. Um, but you've got this middleware, which is going, OK, great. Instead of producing one signature to produce out to beacon layer, uh, it's got an additional peer-to-peer -peer network, um, which is then coordinating and having a BFT consensus over those signatures. So um, making sure it knows which one's the lead, who's going to submit it to the beacon chain, um, and then assembling the signatures from the other peers. And uh, the end result is uh, highly resilient. And you can manage your uh, peer to peer network as well. I know that was one of the questions previously about uh, kind of VPNs. Uh, one of the most common things when you are uh, setting up this type of DB, DBT in infrastructure is a private networking layer between your peers. Um, so the likes of zero tier, um, which is you know, a nice trustless networking where you don't have to rely on a VPN provider or you're not reintroducing centralization um, in at that networking layer. So between the peer-to-peer -peer connections between your DBT nodes and the ability to set up your own uh, private network there, you can ensure, again, the best uptime possible. Cool. So um, I wasn't expecting uh, to be on stage at uh, EdCon, but um, my Discord message, because we've been running one of the OBOL uh, alpha clusters along with uh, other peers in Australia, Korea, and India. So doing a uh, global DBT uh, cluster setup. And uh, just an hour after the uh, non-finality event, and in Ethereum, you know, my Twitter feed was blowing up, and I'm going, but I'm not seeing any notifications. Like, okay, better check on the servers. And yeah, there was just really absolutely no disruption to the DVT cluster um, as a result of the non finality event. And uh, one of the reasons for that is the client diversity. So the uh, different um, people running this cluster have. Uh, different execution clients, different consensus layer clients. Um, so any bug in one of those uh, client software, or as we saw, you know, the spike in network traffic um, that affected some clients, it was resilient to that because that load was shared across all the other validators in that cluster, and they were able to carry on, which I think is pretty impressive for something that's still, you know, kind of in a, a beta um, stage of their rollout. And so another illustration just to kind of back that up. Um, already you could be running any one of these combinations of, of clients. It's really diversity all the way down. And um, the OBOL uh, Karen uh, middleware client is just there for the P2P and coordinating the signers uh, to avoid um, duplicate attestations and uh, slashing from downtime. Cool, so I um, was also asked to kind of share a bit what might be coming around the corner. So DVT is great, you know, I, Eigenlayer was also mentioned a little bit earlier. I, I do think while that adds some smart contract risk, um, it is going to be another uh, stack that people do build on. Um, I wouldn't say rush out and start your Eigenlayer uh, pod. Um, but you know, do think about ways that um, that might uh, be incorporated into your stack. 
Um, the other thing that I see is kind of coming is more and more flexibility around signing, right? So to the earlier points around, hey, great, you can do multi-sig and you can combine different um, types of signing. Um, I'm a big advocate of BLS signatures, and I do think that will become um, the more common um, signing scheme that we'll be using to coordinate signatures going forward. Um, and that will change not just user experiences, but also the efficiency on chain. And yeah, definitely think that we'll see a lot more uh, diversity in ways that that gets combined. And um, yeah, pretty excited about that. Can't remember my third point there, but that's okay. I'm sure it'll come up in the questions. Cool, so just one slide there around um, what we're doing at Everlasting and how we're different to um, perhaps some other staking companies. But like Sam, we are helping clients with the you know kind of knowledge and understanding of how they can get into uh, staking and have the security and the multi-sig set up around it. And then we will also run validator clusters um, either entirely for a client or in a hybrid manner. So say you do have your own um, hardware that you're running validate, um, we can sh split those keys and you might run two validators, we might run three. And I think that hybrid form of staking is gonna be really powerful for people. Um, you know, I was talking earlier uh, with the guy from Block Diamond, you know, like even staking service providers that have built up all this infrastructure and security and expertise uh, can benefit from incorporating uh, distributed validator technology so that they might still, might not earn the same amount of uh, fees uh, that they were charging if they're fully running validators for you, but I think they'll still have a role to play in this future uh, kind of more hybrid mode of um, staking. Cool. All right. Any questions? Uh, yeah. Can I just check? Is there any form, like uh, limitations to multiple signing time latency? Yeah, yeah light, latency um, does get to be a, become an issue over about seven hundred milliseconds, um, but. For a lot of, at least, you know, data centers, you can be uh, different parts of the world and be under 300 milliseconds. And of course, if it's geographically, uh, say, just across Asia, uh, you can be under 200 milliseconds uh, quite easily, even with home ISP connections. So the alpha cluster that I mentioned um, earlier, that's on a home, you know, broadband connection in each of those four countries. And there's just no issues there um, in terms of the latency in order to aggregate the signatures and then submit them. And obviously at Epoch being, you know, kind of six minutes and, you know, each of the duties within that needing to be, um, you know, within the, the boundaries of uh, the duties, it's still plenty of buffer there. Um, so I do think as um, the, peer-to-peer uh, -peer protocols continue to get um, you know, made further optimized, uh, it'll become even less of an issue and you could have potentially a second latency between some of the peers and, and not be affected by it. How about, like, does it affect the NEV optimization or who does choose the relay for such NEV Yeah, so it is still uh, compatible with MEV Boost and you can choose a block builder and it can actually be different block builders on different nodes. I think it's more efficient if you do say, hey, let's all use one uh, common setup. But because the duties are assigned between the active uh, peers on the DBT cluster, um, it's whichever one is having the responsibility to lead in that epoch is the one that will uh, work with the MEV uh, bundling. Will any different where DBS comes along? I don't think it'll change too much. Um, I think obviously there'll be more options and you don't want to introduce latency by having too many different, you know, kind of uh, block builders that you can go out to. 
Um, so at the moment, it's still recommended in a DBT cluster just to have the one block builder. Um, but I do think, um, yeah, you don't want you know, centralization risk there as well. So I, I think it'll improve. Cool. There are a few other questions. All right. I actually have one for you. Cool, thank you. Well, just to ask, right, um, you've given us a very comprehensive overview of what um, Everlasting does. What is one point or one fact, right, that you would like everybody to take away with them at the end of this evening? Yeah, I mean, the main thing does come back to security. Don't trust any single seed phase with all your assets. If uh, everyone goes home and just actually reassesses their uh, kind of security setup, and perhaps if you haven't used a multi-sig, it's also not scary. Um, and it's one of those things that you can progressively get confident using. And um, yeah, if you do need help setting it up, um, we're always here and get in touch. We can uh, guide you through that process as well. Cool. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. A round of applause. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so there's trillions in, in Ethereum now, uh, but when it started, it was all about how do we decentralize the internet? Um, and that was about decentralizing Uber when they raised money. How do we decentralize Airbnb? And all of these apps were not going to be deployed on central servers. They were going to be on this new cloud decentralized world computer, which is actually what Ethereum used to be called. Um, so if we fast forward now, the internet is still pretty centralized. And we have some pretty big technologies uh, shifting how humanity is going to operate in the next couple of years. And so if you log into Twitter, this is kind of what I see when I open my Twitter account. But you see a lot of like fear and, and things hidden society. They're saying AGI is going to cause tremendous societal instability, uh, probably 100x what Silicon Valley managed to do with Facebook in, in 10 years. Um, and then you have you know banks collapsing in, in the West. And, uh, and then crypto is supposed to be the solution. We're saying everything should, everyone should buy ETH and stake it or buy and hold Bitcoin. But what happens when that reality comes true? Um, and so far, all we've seen is FTX and the mainstream society. They look at crypto and they, they see Board Ape Yacht Club and the DGENs. So it, what we're trying to do with Earth Ether is kind of create something a little bit more regenerative for society. That's about how do we create a more sustainable uh, incentive system for the internet, which is really what Ethereum started as, is like creating this new system. So it's, we've boiled it down to a pretty simple protocol. It's, it's as simple as staking your ETH for the Earth. And so it, it's a liquid Ethereum staking protocol. Um, and I believe that one of the biggest things holding back Ethereum and crypto is um, you know, not being able to solve societal problems. If you look at kind of the peak of the bull run here, it was about $10 trillion. Um, you know, we're talking about billions, multiple billions of dollars being allocated to, to miners and, and now staking validators. So if you're participating in Ethereum staking with you know, your home validators, you're actually securing this and you're earning part of this billions of dollars that's being paid out. Um, but that's kind of not really doing much for society. So if it does want to go to a $100 trillion asset class and have a 10x in Bitcoin and go to 100,000 or $1 million dollar Bitcoin, we need to start asking, what is this doing for society? Is it actually going to destabilize everything or is it going to actually regenerate the planet? So that's kind of, uh, this is the overview of, of what Ethereum staking is. But I think what this should look like in an ideal world is not Lido and like Coinbase and like a couple of corporations, they should actually look more like what causes and impact are we doing on the planet? Because this is more actually like, uh, if you look at a government budget spending proposals, this is actually what Ethereum is doing. This is where we're allocating our capital. 10% of Ethereum staking fees on Lido actually just goes to a central company. And it's open source software, doesn't really need to be like that. Um, so this is kind of the overview of Ethereum staking right now. You have centralized companies. Uh, maybe Rocket Pool is probably the best example of how to do it, which is how we've architected our protocol after. Um, and then, you know, Binance, uh, all these other guys. Um, our protocol, Earth Ether, is, is kind of the best of both worlds. So 
Uh, it's modeled after Rocket Pool. It's open source, permissionless. You can stake any amount. Uh, it's compatible with Stakeosaurus, um, any at-home staking protocols. And you can deposit your, um, your ETH. Uh, it'll pool it into a smart contract uh, up, up to 32 ETH, and then it will queue you up with a validator that can basically stake for you, and then a percentage goes to them, percentage goes to impact. We also have a self-custody wallet called Earth Wallet, uh, which is open source on all platforms, so you can self-custody. Um, and I think that's where the space is going. Now you have DeFi that's basically compatible. You can do everything Binance and Coinbase can do on, on DYDX or decentralized uh, protocols. So that's kind of where we see this space going. And then this is our interface. So if you stake your liquid ETH for Earth, um, you can get up to 77% of the protocol goes to the liquid stakers. Uh, in kind of like Lido and Rocket Pool, where you have the governance token, ours is done through the Regen community. It's actually an NFT, um, and then 2% uh, goes to the node operators. Um, in addition to that, our protocol is kind of the only one that allows you to do delegated staking. So, with most uh, staking protocols, you, you'll typically like connect your MetaMask, you'll deposit your ETH, and then your rewards will be paid out to that address. With ours, you can connect your ledger and specify, I want my rewards to be paid out to my hot wallet. This is more because I travel a lot and so I didn't want to carry my ledger everywhere. So I, you can basically get cash flow from your, from your treasury at home and you know, use that as, as like your hot wallet. Um, so this is kind of the overview. And then we're, we're also building an AGI to kind of plug this into the, the whole AGI thing, but you can, you can chat with it right now, the Earth Guardian bot. And so we've actually trained an AGI using GTP4 on basically like the entire sum of history of climate science and environmental research. And so we use that to kind of come up with solutions and align this AI towards solving this problem of, of climate change. Um, and then once the community grows to a certain point, the idea is taking a percentage of the revenue and hopefully having this thing come up with ideas to solve climate change. Um, Earth Wallet's available. You can download it on all platforms. Um, we also support Bitcoin ordinals, so we're Bitcoin and EVM. Um, and that's kind of like the only two that we plan to support. Uh, we also download, a, we plant a tree for every download, so use that. Um, it's available, and yeah, so our goal is kind of to bring balance to crypto by balancing technology, nature, and art, and we think this is kind of the most important thing to do with the internet technology today, and um, yeah, we have a little film that we shot in Bali that we'd love to share with you guys. Um, can we play this? Oh, okay, we'll do that one after. I guess that's, that's kind of it. Um, if you want to follow us on Twitter, uh, we'll be doing like early incentives for early stakers, but uh, it's going to be a fair launch, so uh, we're looking to launch it next month. If anyone wants to be involved, uh, just give me a shout. Okay, before we move on, anybody, any questions for Zook? What is the biggest impact you've had so far uh, working on this project? Yeah, so um, we partner with a company called Dollar Donation Club. So we can plant trees, uh, for, we can do 15 trees in Africa. They're actually educating people on how to grow like cash crops in their town rather than just planting rows of trees. Um, so we were, we were able to do 20,000 trees with them so far. Uh, they can also do uh, three pounds of ocean plastic uh, for a dollar. So we managed to get some good, pretty good partnerships on, on how we can be deploying efficiently, but I'm actually pretty bullish on, on this AGI coming up with some, some good ideas. As I'm sure you've all interfaced with ChatGPT. This thing is pretty remarkable. One for you before you move on. How many trees do you hope to like plant on this planet with this project? I mean, the trees are. It, it's one solution. I think we're looking at like a million would be would be amazing. But I, I do believe like clean energy is is a solution to climate change, and also um, it's actually it's a pretty complex problem, obviously. But um, 
healing the soil and also like the, the nutrients and the way the diets that people are eating is, is actually a good solution. Um, and so we did partner with uh, Save Soil. It was like Sad Guru's initiative, but um, we helped them with some stuff on, on their campaign to, to increase uh, organic soil quality. Um, yeah, there's, there's some good stuff we're working on behind the scenes, but I think long-term clean energy is, is probably the solution. Thank you so much, Sue. So, I think to start this panel, we'll just start with very quick intros. Um, before we get into, you know, talking about staking and running nodes and, you know, there are many verticals in Web3, right? So I really want to understand what's your why. Why are you building what you're building right now? What really fuels you? If you can just, in a minute, you know, give your take, that would be great. Cool. So my main why is actually helping people to secure wealth beyond lifetimes. Um, being in the security side of the crypto Web3 industry, uh, it's been really painful either seeing friends or even being approached by clients asking, hey, how can you help me? My loved ones pass away and uh, we've got some instructions and we don't know what to do. So that's one of those things that really drives me um, because it is a large unsolved problem. And Obviously, there's lots of layers of security and setup and things around that, but uh, yeah, every day just knowing that we've secured more wealth, um, your, uh, assets are going to the grave is a big driving force. Awesome. Uh, my name's Sukhvir. Um, yeah, my why is I kind of started in crypto a while ago, and I remember it was about the kind of Wall Street, Occupy Wall Street movement, and back then it was supposed to be a new financial system. Uh, I was also co-founder of Polymath, which was kind of invented security tokens. Uh, I was an early engineer at LedgerX, which was the first CFTC regulated Bitcoin exchange, got acquired by FTX. And so I've seen it all, I feel, in crypto and like to see it kind of come full circle and almost recreate the same financial system, potentially even worse in a lot of ways in like the degeneracy. Like I know Wall Street wasn't great, but it needs to be about something bigger, so I, I'm trying to solve that. Um, so I'll start with a more practical view. So if you think about the Web3 value chain, right, um, the no operations vertical is actually uh, a low beta rate, once again, right, to get exposure to the industry. So it, it suits my con conservative temperament. And if we zoom out to the ideological picture, um, this settlement layer is the most important to get right. Uh, otherwise, everyone will be building on shaky foundations. So, I want to contribute in some way myself. Uh, while the Giga Greens are uh, uh, lowering the barriers to entry on the capital and the technical side, I, I want to contribute to uplift the technical abilities on the general users to meet these uh, lowering barriers to entry halfway. Um, otherwise, we will always at some point need to rely on blind trust assumptions, and that always leads to catastrophic outcomes. Awesome. So now I'd like to kind of ask you guys, I'm, I'm going to paint, we're going to start with the future and then work backwards. Um, so, you know, let's fast forward to, you know, 10 years from now, 2033, right? In layman terms and from, you know, the way you guys are thinking about, you know, what you're building, the things you're working on and how you kind of see the future to be. Could you kind of, you know, you know, put it out there for the audience as to, you know, what the staking ecosystem and what the node ecosystem would look like, um, and and preferably in a relatable way to, to people who maybe don't even understand it, right? Um, like, what what is the potential of this? Um, I think that would be interesting. So maybe we could start with Samuel. Maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, hardware of the future, or the fidelity of how these things could be. Um, yeah. Sure, sure. Um, <clears throat> Maybe uh, I'll talk about hardware of the future for no sticking and also a general mindset shift um, from users where I foresee they will start to care more about running their own service. Because in the Web 2 world, no one wants to run their own service. Um, but in the Web 3 world, I foresee that this to change a little bit. So, first on the hardware side, I think sticking hardware will continue to become smaller, more low powered, cheaper, and more accessible to individuals. Um, there are already several projects that are running. Uh, hobbies who are creating like uh, you know Raspberry Pi and you know, taking software. 
Um, and um, you know, there might be even a possibility where you go to Simlin Square and those people selling uh, computers, right? Operands of the shop selling you dedicated and aesthetically pleasing no hardware, <laughs> as, as blockchain goes become more prevalent. Um, but I, I want to add that, you know, I think wallets have a very big part to play uh, to drive mass adoption as well, because I, I would imagine in a future world, um, a close integration between wallets and nodes will allow users to manage, configure, troubleshoot their nodes using their mobile apps, uh, while still maintaining the level of trustlessness. Yeah. Um, so from a philosoph philosophical uh, point, um, because of all these uh, conveniences that are built in a trustless manner, more people will find it uh, more appealing to run their own node hardware. And also, incentives become clearer and more diverse, with major players like Lido and Pura opening up their node operator sets to communities, to individuals. But I think maybe uh, as an interim step, you see more people like me as community node operators start to appear and emerge first and before it goes to the general public. Um. Um. Yep. So, so I have a slightly different question for you, so I, uh, it would be great if you could talk about the same, but for wallets. Sure. Um, yeah, I see wallets as the future. Uh, the whole point in crypto is to own your keys. So this whole like centralized model was only necessary because we couldn't put the order books on chain um, and because you need to kind of do fast settlement and bridge assets across networks. Um, these are now possible mostly through you know, layer zero and there's other kind of bridging protocols, the, the options exchanges you can do, DYDX, there's layer two networks for all that. So the user experience of all that's kind of gone. I, I think everyone will own their keys uh, and then that contributes to kind of everyone being able to vote on where their, their staking capital goes. Um, that, that kind of is, is gonna enable us to bootstrap a new decentralized governance system on a scale that wasn't possible before. Um, that's kind of where I see it going. And um, yeah, for you, Paul, if you could talk a little bit about you know key management, if you could talk a little bit about DBT and what that means, and preferably if you could also touch on what it means for the next billion users who don't even know about this, that would be great. Cool. So yeah, looking at 10 years from now, um, we will have seen people actually inherit validators from, say, their parents, right? And it'll be passed on without, like, withdrawing your ETH back out and then redepositing it or uh, cashing out. I think as a productive asset, we're, the mind shift is going to really change of this multi-generational kind of wealth approach. Um, but at the same time, it won't just be for, you know, the already wealthy, right? Uh, we'll see and part of the um, you know, optimism that was there in early crypto movements was around you know, banking the unbanked or giving people uh, this egalitarian access to wealth. Um, and still there's a large number of people locked out of uh, even crypto, right? And um, we will see that shift, I think, more now that we can actually um, you know, split that apart, make it into smaller pieces, and have people have a much lower barrier of entry uh, to access that, and it will grow over time. And yeah, key management-wise, uh, definitely uh, to echo you know, the earlier points around how broken our current wallet model is, Frank, you kind of left with these two choices of um, somebody centralized manages your keys, um, or you take on that full burden yourself, and we're going to see a lot more uh, hybrid uh, solutions to that and, uh, and bring that in a trustless fashion that doesn't have the centralization risk of, of relying too heavily on providers. Awesome, thanks. So kind of, you know, we talked about the future a little bit. Now coming back to today, I think I want to work a little bit on what tools and what people need to be thinking about building so that we can get to this future that we just discussed about. So maybe we could start with you, Sam. Um, I think in your, in your first, you know, in your presentation on, on setting up your home node, I think you had like nine steps uh, and, and like four different like intersections of like multidisciplinary things that you need to know about in order for you to be able to set up your node. Um, obviously for, you know, for the everyday person that's going to be incredibly complicated. From your experience, 
what do you think, you know, out of all these steps, of where do you think things can be abstracted away? Where do you think people should be looking at building, uh, building for and, you know, focusing on? Yeah, yeah. so I think precisely because it's not a simple process for, to get laymen to become inducted to be a validator operator. So uh, the number one thing I think we should put more effort to building is a sustainable education process to pass on the mantle of an operator to newcomers. Um, how do you design an incentive structure that continuously uh, encourages people to pass on quality knowledge to newcomers? I think that's one um, difficult problem. Um, between now and then, I think DVTs will have a very large role to play as well. And also, I think you asked for three, right? I think the last one will be accessible and open source hardware. Uh, uh, and of course, cheap hardware it should become more accessible. Cool. Um, I, for Sook, it would be cool if you could touch a little bit on the role AI has to play in this. Maybe, do you think GPT has a role to maybe come in and, and, and abstract away certain functions in this process? Or do you think that the AI models of today are not, you know, they're just, they're just not there in terms of tackling you know, these type of functions. Obviously with auto GPT and things like that, we're mm -hmm. definitely starting to see more automation coming in. Yeah, yeah that's a good question. Um, I think AI is actually pushed to the edges a lot, so we're, run, we're gonna run the models on our own devices. Um, the, the thing that AI causes is, is more a break in the economic system of like, we ran on capitalism for so long off labor, and so we're gonna have to find new ways of giving people purpose and giving people a, like, you know, a UBI. Like you're you're literally seeing Worldcoin come out, and Sam Altman's building a UBI system based off of crypto wallets. So everyone's gonna download a wallet and get a UBI paid out for by Worldcoin by scanning your eyeball, which is a whole other story. I don't think it's the right approach. Um, and these are the same guys who funded FTX. And you know the other great things that have come out of Silicon Valley, but um, and so I think with AI, like we need to give the keys to everyone to, to participate. But you know it, it's going to be more uh, a different system. I think Ethereum staking is actually the right approach, where you know there's still an aspect of capitalism in, in accumulating wealth and storing it, and then having the ability to say where it goes. Um, and so we're kind of sitting in the middle there. But. Awesome. Yeah, Paul, you could chime in on the same. I guess it would be cool if you could talk a little bit about, you know, um, when it comes to tools specific to our current kind of model of, like, we, you have self-custody for everyday users, you've got self-custody for institutions, like, the tools would differ drastically, and there's also costs involved in all of this. There's social recovery, account abstraction, all of these guys trying to open source um, the, you know, this aspect of you know, self-custody, right? So it would be really nice to get your perspective. Yeah, again, uh, a lot of the tools that are being built are also open source, and that's one of the wonderful things, is it's actually just a matter of taking what is and will be built in the coming years and actually just making it accessible to everyday people. Um, you know, the number of uh, people I run into in Web3 who haven't used a safe multi-sig or any multi-sig of any kind, uh, it's still really surprising because, you know, multi-sigs on Bitcoin have been there since 2014 and, you know, it's continually evolving, but it's been predominantly used by people um, in organizational type ways, you know, so your DAOs, treasury manager, fund managers, um, but the same tooling is fundamentally able to be rolled out. So one of the things uh, that we're looking at is uh, using non-interactive NPCs, or instead of relying on multi-party computation happening in a data center on specialized hardware, which does have a significant setup cost and ongoing maintenance, and that's what where institutions are playing, actually bringing that down and coordinating the key generation and signing um, across protocols in a way that it's just a fraction of the cost. And then we, that's where we get onboarding this next wave of users into something that is so much more resilient um, key management, but isn't costing an arm and leg. I think um, uh, we had an interesting conversation before as well, and you were talking a little bit about the legal building blocks that kind of need to exist 
um, would be great if you could touch on that. Um, just you know, just like mindset shifts and how people can work within our existing kind of boundaries that we have. Yeah, legal frameworks are always interesting because you kind of go to what's the traditional or old world analog and try to kind of fit crypto assets into that. We've seen um, over the last 10 years a lot of uh, countries accept crypto assets as a form of property, um, but that's been a kind of blanket and then they've been surprised when the NFTs or other types of assets come along and like, oh, is that still fitting in the same class? Uh, so I, I still think there is a bit of um, you know, evolution still to happen in the legal framework side of things. Obviously some countries like Singapore are further ahead uh, than some of the other regulators. Um, but the thing is that we need to actually make sure that it is in a legal structure. So if uh, it's accepted that crypto assets, uh, the asset themselves is the property, not the private key, um, then we can start to actually build in okay, great, here's how the tech maps today, but also not locked in that if regulations change, you have to go rebuild the whole tech. Um, and so I think we're at this interesting nexus now where uh, there's enough clarity on both of those points of tech uh, meeting with the legal frameworks and existing professionals like lawyers and wealth managers um, that we're going to get a lot more progress in the coming years. Got it. Thanks. And um, I think we'll go to the next question, um, basically looking at how can we get Web3 non-natives to be contributing to securing the network. Um, crazy ideas are welcome, um, but if you guys have thought about this, that would be great to, you know, it's open to all, anyone can feel free to answer. Yeah, I, I think in order to get uh, non web free natives to participate in proof of stake, yeah, uh, I think we first have to sell them ETSM <laughs> or any other staking assets for that matter because they, they have to first be convinced that they want to hold E for the long term. Um, and, and in order to do that, I think more use cases need to be built and, and real use cases. So. Uh, aside from Ponzi news, right? So this is where my expertise ends and I'm going to defer to the rest of you guys here about <laughs> this future. But anyway, I think maybe back to my point, um, one way would be Wallace will have a big uh, part to play in this, where a close integration between Wallace and known devices uh, in a trustless way uh, can e enable an uh, ease of, uh, uh, on a technical side for new users on or laymen to spin up and configure their nodes. This in combination with the lowering uh, capital barriers to entry, eventually, uh, even with DVTs, right, you can split the, uh, fractionalize the stake of your validator and then share rewards amongst your cluster, your squad. Maybe you can stake with as little as one ETH in the future, who knows, right? Combining that with the ease of setting up and configuring the validators, I think that will be an appeal uh, to get non web natives to participate in the staking network. Um, I think the answer is art and getting artists involved. Um, and so basically, what we're planning to launch after we go live, you can stake your ETH for as little as 0.1 ETH, and that, that will be for people who have Ethereum or finance people. But the majority of the world, uh, it, there's a lot of artists out there. So we're trying to find ways that you could create art and mint an NFT and earn Earth tokens as well. And so you'd be earning a yield bearing asset, and you'd automatically be participating in ETH. I think. The concept of just holding ETH won't make sense in a few years when you can hold a, a liquid token that's generating yield off of it as well. Um, yeah, so definitely onboarding artists and making it easy. I think the problem with NFTs though is uh, you don't want artists to be incentivized to like financialize it. It's like the wrong side of their brain. So they really want to do it for a purpose. And, and so I think that's where we're trying to tie in, you know, bringing them to, maybe we'll bring them on hikes and you know, do music studios in nature or some, something like that. Yeah, and um, kids, really. You know, so it's funny how often we come across people from all generational aspects of life, right? And quite often it might be a person at retirement age that has capital, but the kid actually wants to engage in it, right? And so you do see this multi-generational, well, okay, well, let's collaborate, you know, let's, let's take granddad's capital and put it to work and then split it. And um, yeah, so I, I have seen that uh, even pre-staking uh, kind of evolution 
um, of families, you know, really going, hey, let's let's adopt a new technology that is of interest uh, to a new, you know, upcoming uh, generation, and through that, um, you actually are sharing that knowledge and uh, doing that in a way that benefits the whole family unit, and uh, yeah, that creates a legacy, which is uh, obviously really important as well. Um, so we're moving on to the final kind of segment. Um, so this is around the idea of realigning incentives and how you know staking kind of plays a crucial role in that. I think we've seen that you can realign incentives around different things. Earth Wallet being an example. Um, so we'd love to get you know separate kind of opinions on you know how we kind of see this moving around. So how how do we think about you know the future of like what, how, how, do we, how do we not make this a very niche thing? How do we make this a common thing? How can, you know, how can societies kind of accept this? How can people get into you know, creating these incentive mechanisms for you know, everyone to kind of participate in? Um, I think one, one thing that I've seen is that e-folders and e-stakers, right, is to burn some of the incentives that, that, that the e stakers receive. And, and we've seen this once with I think EIP 1559 where the base fee for every transaction is burned, right? So when it's burned, the total supply goes down, which means everyone, the value is distributed to everyone else who, who owns ETH. And then there's an upcoming proposal, um, maybe not anytime soon, but in the next three to five years, that they're exploring burning the MEV. Right, or at least part of the MEV component, which again will make it uh, more uh, incentivized generally for all e holders instead of just uh, uh, e stakers. So what this will lead to right, is that anyone who buys and holds e right, would be indirectly contributing to the economic security of e itself. Um, so. I think uh, you mentioned the DAO earlier on Ethereum, and I remember going to the meetups when they were created, and Ethereum has now essentially become a giant DAO. Like the staking yield going to stakers has turned it into a global DAO on a scale that we've never seen before. And so I think all the DAO experiments that we've seen, um, you know, they kind of fail in comparison to the scale that we've reached now. We, the thing that we're missing is, is kind of a purpose of, of what is it that this government or this DAO is supposed to solve? What is like, what is the point in Ethereum, right? And if any government, when it creates debt, it, it usually issues a currency in order to like solve a problem. Like the U.S. had to pay a war debt, so they created this system to pay it off somehow. And right now, if you look at the greatest problems in the world, you know, it's it's climate change. It's there's like major problems in in terms of like societal instability. So. I don't know the answer, but I think the, it starts by setting the intention of what is the point, and we need to set it to the highest point of society. So that's kind of where, where we think about it. So yeah, in terms of what were some of the incentives that we've already seen for builders, uh, because obviously nothing new gets built unless new builders come and have those ideas and innovate and, and build it out. and. For a lot of the early Ethereum developers, it was just they held ETH and it appreciated in value. So they could afford to dedicate you know, 50 hours plus a week into building some of the smart contracts and tools that we use today. Obviously, the ICOs were this weird uh, incentive spike. It was almost like a shock to the system of like, okay, now we're trying to tokenize everything. And I think we've learned a lot of the lessons from that, but that's not going to be a sustainable model to build out new projects. Um, and as we start to shift to more of the staking and network health aligned incentives, um, I'd like to see more developers funded through not just grants that are kind of one-off, um, it's like actually allocating staking rewards uh, to some of the, the projects and protocols that you're using as a way to support those developers to keep innovating and building. And that's how we actually get it away from being um, reliant on new capital coming into the system or VCs and um, other types of uh, ad hoc funding. We can actually make it really sustainable to be a builder on Web3. Awesome. 
Yeah, I think that that brings us to the end. Open the floor to any questions anyone might have. early stages we haven't helped a lot of people secure their wealth yet and so it's all the people that might be passing away um, at this point in time that we could have helped uh, that still keeps me up and um, like I said earlier is part of that why and uh, yeah got to just keep scaling and get on top of that so I can sleep better um, I think it's mostly around AI it's it's thinking about like once you realize the potential of this stuff and um, how drastically it can change society and how few people realize like, or even have the ability to do anything about it, right? It's, it's almost like a runaway train at this point, it feels like. So um, I think crypto and tech and this internet stuff we're building has a potential to do good, um, but it's really up to us to make sure that it does. And there's not enough of that conversation or builders like, Focusing on that, I think the, the economic system that is coupled to um, has driven it a certain way, and unfortunately, it's really hard to stop that. Um, it's like the Moloch Dow problem, right? So that's like the Moloch keeps me up at night. <laughs> uh, I think for me, it's once again um, spreading the message of uh, self sovereignty and maximizing decentralization on the settlement layer to more people, getting more individuals on board with running their own nodes contributing to the economic security and decentralization in any way possible. Um, because um, whether you know it or not, uh, the Ethereum network is always under attack from centralization factors. First you have the uh, OPEC censorship, right? A lot of uh, censoring uh, transactions, right? And then now you have a lack of climate, climate diversity, a concentration in, in maybe like GAF or like PRISM. Um, so when, and it's maybe it's partly driven by institutions uh, being, so one, being the ones really running these uh, validated nodes. So when more people come on then they will naturally disperse the, the choices of these uh, uh, layers all across. Maybe this month, slightly more for Seth. Sure. Um, I guess the centralization with self sovereignty for the nodes quite well known, uh, but probably one of the biggest link is RTC nodes, mm. which have no nodes incentive, and probably the more important to get more people running RTC nodes than sticking on. So, uh, the common like, is the technical, so we know. And the centralization from the Tifera, uh, Alchemy, and this. They yeah. have the most. What I think about that, um, I think at least uh, today right, we're in a much better state because I think in, in, even in the last cycle there was only Infura, uh, and maybe we start to hear about Alchemy, now there's Pocket Network, there's a few others, I can't name all the top of my head. And what's promising now right, is that Infura, the bellwether of them, uh, is has, has this initiative to decentralize their non operators. Right? But I mean, it's a good step in the right direction, right? How it plays out, we still have to find the right use cases, right? Uh, that would be applicable because uh, let's face it, like your home servers will not be as powerful as the ones in the data centers. So uh, probably the use cases will be like you know not so urgent or like less computing power requirements. Um, but for developers, you can or for users, right? You can choose to connect your own RP, MetaMask RPC to your own node today if you want to. Yeah, just to add on that as well of, um, you know, kind of you don't want to add fragility to your validator node by having another open port, right? So just trying to minimize any attack surface or DOS uh, ability on your node. But um, there's also Hopper, which allows to, um, you know, kind of load balance that as, as well and, and have that on a peer-to-peer -peer basis with existing nodes. Uh, so I do think we will solve the RPC centralization problem. Um, it's 
just how Gate made it in a little bit more and a bit more adoption as well. It was about your thing, but. Any more? No? Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Just want to take a moment to thank Sid for being such an excellent moderator. Yes, thank you. And of course, I'd like to thank Paul for ever asking for like, sharing you know, how to stay more securely. Yeah, before the tech vectors, we, we, we need to take care of our yeah, setups better. Okay, so also want to say thank you to Sook. You have given us a very inspiring vision of how we can, you know, harness technology to build a sustainable future for everybody. Literally everybody gets um, a slice of the pie that's ahead of us. I, I think that's great. Okay, and Sam, oh my god, you are giving us an uh, unruggable solution. <laughs> not not, not unruggable, uh, the most unruggable option. Most unruggable option. Huh? Okay. It's still ruggable. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Then you can share us, uh, share a bit more in your upcoming talks. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Um, yeah. Also, we are so to thank also Maniala for hosting us, having us today. Yes, thank you so much. Um, and we hope to be back again at some point. Can we? Can we? Can we? We are always. Uh, mentioned earlier, we are always welcome to people who want to share good content, one of our mandates about knowledge sharing. Um, so if anyone has you know, great content that they would love to share with um, audience or community, feel free to reach out to us. Okay, um, I'm just going to answer Luke's question as well. What keeps me up at night, right? Other people who are like millennials, like me, who can't sleep because they can't see what's next. Everybody's on this journey together, right? What's next? What, because we, we will actually need to see the future, right? So that's one of the reasons why I decided to you know, be part of this community and help bring all these events to more people. Yeah. So um, it says on the tin, right? If 6 five is all about growth and exploration for all. We are being inclusive. We want this to be as community centered as possible. Feel free to like bring other like-minded people into our community. Um, we will share everything from like the 201 related kind of topics up to like 401 kind of topics. Uh, and if you want to contribute to our project, you can uh, do so at the tip jar at e65.e. That will help us, you know, like maybe produce swag for the community. Yep. Thank you so much. Um, that's food. Uh, and there's swag in front, help yourself. <laughs> they, they, they come from all sorts of places, right? They come from, they have some from San Fran, some from Bogota and all that. So they've come from all over the world. Please come check it out. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I, I don't know. Log off now. <laughs>